Hello, this is uh, Christian Idealism. So today I have Michael Jones on and we are going to be responding to some criticisms of his video on the be bigger moral fruits argument debunked. So just so that you are caught up, you guys are caught up with this kind of dialogue back and forth uh, video responses. So the meager moral fruits argument is an argument that started with Paul Draper many years ago. And of course, he doesn't use the argument now anymore, but it was picked up by a few atheists. Um, so particularly Emerson Green and Benjamin Watkins have proposed this argument. Um, about a year ago or so, Emerson made a blog post or a video on it, kind of laying out the argument. And then what happened was IP came across it on Twitter, and then they started going back and forth in Twitter threads. And then he decided to make his own video kind of... Um, responding to the argument directly. And now we're back with Emerson Green and Ben Watkins kind of defending the argument itself and making a lot of claims like we don't understand your argument or stuff like that. So we're going to go over that today and uh, sort of review um, what they had to say. Um, so yeah, I just, yeah, just to get you guys caught up on that. Um, so Michael, what did you think of their <laughs> podcast? Well, I mean, I only came up once, to be fair. Uh, yeah. I was confused about their whole approach to this argument. Uh, there's a lot of issues I had going through with it. And, of course, you know, I, I respect them, but I just think the argument is just really, really bad. Still do after this podcast that I listen to them do. I, I don't think it works. I think people need to keep in mind as we go through this, and I'll bring this up again, is that everything they said could have just been reversed and it could have been a two-argument could have been a conversation between two Christians. They could have been making what I would call a magnificent moral fruits argument. They could have just been saying, well, you know, I mean, because they didn't really cite a lot of, or any concrete evidence, at least in this video. They have elsewhere, but they've tried to bring up studies. And I'll bring up some studies here, of course, like I typically do. Uh, but everything they said could have just been reversed. You could have had two theists talking about, well, you know, like our understanding of what the good is, we see atheists are sort of fighting against it. Meanwhile, Christians are fighting for this as good. This is evidence for the magnificent moral fruits argument. So I think that's one of the biggest problems with this whole argument is that everything that they say or use can just be reversed and used by Christians to actually argue for Christianity if we're being fair, if we're using the same criteria they're kind of using. So I think that's one of the biggest deficiencies of this argument. It just leaves us in, in the middle where, you know, both sides could be making the exact same argument and it gets us nothing. Yeah, I mean, that kind of, I mean, to be fair, I, I do think what they're trying to do is they're trying to go off this minimalist view of evidence or this idea, like, my, per, like, basically, my personal experience of having a bad interaction with Christians is itself evidence against Christianity. And, and yeah. they do get into that. But it's like, I feel like you can do the, the opposite way as well. Like, if I have different moral intuitions, um, I can come to the, the exact opposite conclusion and like, how are you going to determine which side ha actually has it right right on that so well i mean as i would say we we should go to the sociological yeah. study well that's the thing as i was say is i feel like what you're starting to do is you're kind of like doing a symmetry breaker where basically the symmetry breaker in this case is going to be the actual sociological literature rather than you know per people's personal experiences right so that's kind of what your approach is um yeah so yeah we'll be going and over that Oh, Go we're ahead. going over that. And I, of course, I've got even more studies I can bring up now that I have never mentioned in my videos because I constantly am finding new studies that once again show the benefits of Christianity. All right. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, but here's the video. And I'll. I know you have specific timestamps you want to go to, so I'll stop. Well, I don't think we need to literally watch the yeah. whole thing. No, I yeah. Mean, I think I think everyone should go watch this, first of all. I think we should be clear that they should get both sides, and we don't need to just play their whole video. We can just play sections of it and respond to that. It just, I don't want to be here for three hours. No, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, definitely. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Emerson Green. A few preliminaries before we get going. First, this is not a direct rejoinder to the inspiring philosophy video about the meager moral fruits argument, though it does come up and many of the things we say are relevant to that video. I think everything needed to respond to that video has been said, especially after this episode, but it still warrants a more direct engagement. I'm just not in a terrible hurry to get something out. In discussing this argument over the past year, I've been struck by the lack of convergence from its opponents. There's not really any one main objection or two or three main objections. Responses are just all over the place. And for that reason, I want to have an open hangout related to the meager moral fruits argument 
an open hangout like Digital Gnosis often has on his YouTube channel, where anyone can hop on the stream and offer their objections to the argument. Seems like that might be useful since I've heard literally dozens of objections to the argument, and it's hard to address them all since they're so disparate. Besides, most opponents to the argument don't bother listening to or reading anything the defenders of the argument have to say, so I feel the best way to deal with all the stuff that's thrown against the wall when the argument comes up is to just have a dialogue about it. So if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure to do that. I also wanted to say that one hesitation, possibly the only hesitation I feel in presenting this argument, is that I'm not giving the religious believers in my life who are amazing people and have been a positive moral witness their due. I sometimes feel a tinge of guilt when I defend this argument since I can be misunderstood as saying that there are no Christians who I respect or look up to as sources of moral wisdom. That's not at all true. So I have two things to say on this, one negative and one positive. The negative is that this concern, framed as an objection to the argument, is not any good. It should be obvious that claims made about Christianity as a whole don't reflect on every single individual person, just as claims about the United States don't reflect on every individual U.S. citizen. You could say something true about the United States, and yet it would be trivially easy to find 10 people who seemed to straightforwardly disconfirm whatever claim was made. On a strictly argumentative level, this is totally insignificant, but on an interpersonal level, it's highly significant. There are Christians in my life who are wise, intelligent, moral people. They've been a positive witness in my life, even though I don't agree with them about every minute ethical issue. In fact, if more Christians were like them, I never would have offered this argument to begin with. The last thing I want to do is give the impression that I have anything other than love and respect for these people in my life. All right. Um, so he didn't really provide an argument there, but he did kind of make this point where, um, given his personal... Ex so again, it goes back to this whole personal experience um, problem, because I could just do the exact same thing in reverse. Right. Well, yeah, he talked about how there's. Uh, he started off, and they're going to get into this later. He said yeah. there's no convergence of objections to the argument. And my first, I have a bunch of things to say on that, but my first question, my first thing to say is, well, this is a fairly new argument, and I've not seen a lot of formal replies to it at this point. Maybe we should wait for philosophers to evaluate it more and see what they come up with. I mean, let's give it a second. <laughs> uh, he also talked about it being, having an open hangout. I think that's a great idea. I personally uh, would just prefer to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with him. I don't want to be in a giant hangout with people where because of, you know, uh, internet speeds and th there's the delay, people end up talking over each other. I just find those frustrating. But again, my invitation, Emerson, is always, I'm always willing to have an open conversation to talk to him on this. Uh, he talks about good questions, and I think you cut him off. Can you play the next 10 seconds? Because he says something oh. here that I want to I bring up. Sorry, I was, uh, let me go back to. Yeah, okay, here like, we go. yeah 10 yep. seconds. Today, Positive. Yeah. I'm overwhelmingly grateful to have them in my life. I can honestly say that if more Christians were like you, the odds that I would be a Christian would increase dramatically. Okay. So that's, yeah. well, that's, that's, <laughs> I thought that was a very interesting point, what he said there. Me personally, maybe I should give some of my own story here. Um, so I, I was raised in a very fundamentalist church. I got picked on, beat up at church. One time I got a concussion at church. Uh, so my, my family was often you know, criticize. I, I've been around in the church for being too liberal or being too far to like, you know, you know we dress too flimsy. You know, my mother would show her shoulders sometimes in church and the, the, the audacity. So I've been around a lot of, you know, really, I would say bad believers. My wife and I went through a living hell before we got married because her family tried to separate us. Uh, and, you know, that obviously failed. But I, I, I would never, I don't, I never have thought in my time that I would base the truth of Christianity on, the way people act, just like I'm not going to judge uh, Islam based on how many bad Muslims I come across, because I know some friends that are really good Muslims that I, I have. I mean, like, I, I so I, I just always find that fascinating. And well, they, almost go ahead. No, well, they, I mean, they do get into that later. Where um, if a religion is true, I think they say something like, "If a religion is true, wouldn't we expect them to act morally?" Right. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that. I mean, I, yeah. I, I covered that a lot in my video to begin with, with regards to sanctification. But when I was making the video, my, my reply to the meager moral fruits argument, I kept thinking, like, is, does this argument almost fail and just collapse to another version of divine hiddenness? And when Emerson said that just now, that's what I thought. Like, if, you know, believers were better, then maybe I would be a Christian. And you could almost say that maybe the argument is not so much a meager moral fruits argument, but God should have made these people sanctified quicker so they're a better witness and then I would uh, experience Christianity in a different way. Uh, so maybe it's not even, I mean, so this is something I was pondering when I was making my video. Like, 
does this argument in some way just collapse to divine hiddenness? And when he sort of said that, that just reminded me of this, this whole thought I had back there. But, and I remember when we're thinking like, maybe if you press the proponent of the argument further and further, it will just collapse to divine hiddenness, but just an interesting thought I had about it there. No. Yeah. We'll get into that. Cause I do have uh, my own thoughts about that in the sense of like, what do we, what, what, what what would we expect <laughs> to be the case if Christianity were true, right? Um, and like that gets to the whole theological um, premise. Okay. But, Do you yeah. want me to like raise my hand if I want you to stop or something? That works? no, just just yell out because I okay. I don't see when I whenever I play the video I can't I can't see. I'll just I'll just go into my Cartman voice. Go, Kyle, stop the damn video. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do you mind if I say something before we get started about why I'm interested in the meager moral fruits argument? Yes, please. Um, I I saw a tweet from Kenny Pierce a long time ago. It was about an article called What's Your Religion from the AP. It said, what's your religion in the U.S.? A common reply now is none. And Kenny said, none of the people interviewed report abandoning religion because of the arguments about the existence of God. They found that the religious communities they knew were not enabling them to pursue the good for themselves and for others and struck out on their own. So I read the article and then I dug up some data from Barna which actually did say that a lot of people um, leave religion because of the arguments, particularly the argument from evil. But things that could be classified as meager moral fruits took up a pretty big chunk of space. Like many are leaving Christianity, especially like young people, because of their moral judgments. Injustices in Christian history, Christian hypocrisy was something that was listed, experiences within Christian communities, you know, things that like relate to the behavior of Christians and Christian leaders and Christian institutions and so on. So it's not like I like came to this argument thinking, yeah. So he talked about uh, past Christian atrocities, and that that sort of made me go, okay, well, I know he's not making this argument. I'm not accusing him, yeah. but I know he's citing Christians that sort of make this argument. And so one of the reasons seems to be Christians are leaving Christianity because they think Christianity in the past has historically been a force for evil. And this is, yeah, I'll see people making this type of claims all the time. And it's just the, 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 the corpse of the conflict thesis coming out again. So take, for example, um, the idea that, you know, Christianity caused all sorts of medieval torture and witch burning. Let me quote an atheist here, Nathan Johnston, who I interviewed on my channel. So this is about the Inquisition. He's replying to Sam Harris. He said on page 224, he says, between the end of the Roman Empire and the late 12th century, torture had fallen into disuse in Europe. Sam Harris might be surprised to learn that Christendom owed its reintroduction not to bloodthirsty clerics, but to scientific jurists concerned to free justice from the reliance on God's intervention and to champion human judicial competence. In both medieval Europe and modern day America, then societies that had abandoned torture contemplated its reintrodu reintroduction as a rational necessity. But the medieval story, the one for which we know the ending, recounts the failure of rationalism to control its own offspring. So he debunks a lot of myths about Christian history, like witch burnings, this whole rationalism. Uh, talks about myths that even atheists try to use with the USSR. Just And so you can also check out another great book called The Myth of Religious Violence by William Cavanaugh, or some of the articles even on Tim O'Neill's website, History for Atheists. The, this idea that you know religion has been such a force for evil in the past is just a modern myth. And so, I mean, again, I'm not saying Emerson is making this argument, but it did make, remind me of this, is that a lot of Christians are, leave, a, a lot of ex-Christians are citing what they think is, the reputation of Christianity. It's not the truth about Christian history. It's this facade, this, this Hollywood concocted history, this a warped reputation of what Christianity has done in the past as their reason to leave Christianity. And this just goes back to one of my criticisms in, in the video on the meager moral fruits argument, which is that a lot of what is happening is people are saying, well, Christianity has been a force for evil, but that's not the truth of it. They're citing a warped reputation that modern um, proponents of the conflict thesis, new atheist Hollywood has given us as sort of, the, you know, this is why Christianity is evil. So they're not actually citing what the truth is. They're citing a, a false narrative as their reason for it. And so when a lot of these people in these Barna polls are leaving Christianity, are they leaving because Christianity really is a force for evil? Or are they just been fed alive through Hollywood, the media, bad history, people spreading these myths about you know Christianity causing witch burnings and torture and war, when that's just not the case at all. Yeah, it's sort of what I kind of thought as well is like um, people can, like if, if I didn't know any better and if I were told, you know, through Hollywood or whatever, if I was influenced by people 
and I came to believe that Christianity sort of is what caused all this, then yeah, I would leave as well. Um, of course, independently of what I know now, but like if I was just a regular person and I was felt, you know, told this information and I didn't know any better, then yeah, I would leave as well. But of course, when you do your, when you do your research, it's the exact opposite, right? Yeah, I mean, people still bring up things like, oh, the church tried to stop science. I'm like, what the church is, I mean, outside historians, it will say that the church was crucial for the development of science. Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? I mean, but they're getting it from the Hollywood narrative. You know, I'll yeah. see people telling me to watch the movie Kingdom of Heaven from 2005. Because that's like historically accurate. And it's not at all in many, many ways. Uh, but I mean, like, or, so we need to be careful here with, with what with what these with what Emerson is using as data. Are these people actually leaving Christianity because they see Christianity actually being a force for evil? Or is it because they just they've been fed a lie, a false reputation? Are they also changing uh another issue i have is do they have an understanding of the good different from christianity well i mean that happens quite often a lot of children now or throughout history have rebelled and picking it and have taken different moral foundations than what their parents have told them because it's very common for children to want to rebel from what their parents have taught them in a lot of cultures and choose something else as the nature as the foundation of the good or choose a different moral um Framework, moral yeah. system framework right. system yeah that's a yeah. Way, way to put it yeah so there's a lot of issues with that right there and so that alone it's not and i would say good data to suggest that you know people are leaving christianity for justifiable reasons they may have been if they're citing things like the conflict thesis they definitely aren't right uh, let's continue thinking oh i'm going to try to convince people to leave christianity because of this i was thinking like oh people have already left christianity because of the meager moral fruits argument or like you know some version of those meager moral fruits considerations well i mean so he, notice how he's talking about a version well if you're talking about the conflict thesis if that's a version of the moral view or fruits <laughs> argument then that that doesn't work right yeah, so, and, and, yeah well this is why we need to cite actual historical data to show this is the case we just cannot be like well some people left christianity because they're upset that they don't think christianity is really a force for good Okay, but have they been lied to? Have have they gotten the wrong history of these things? Have they got have they not seen what the sociological studies have actually shown, which I bring up in my videos all the time? I mean, like yeah. sometimes people change their views for bad information. That does not mean you can make an objective argument that Christianity actually is not a force for good, if that's what they're doing here. Yeah. Right. And and I was mainly just trying to work out whether that reasoning that's already being given is defensible or whether it's just totally irrational to think that the fruits of a religion have anything to do with whether it's true. So I don't think it's irrational to weigh your moral judgments of a religion into one, whether it's true, and two, whether you should be an adherent. You know, like, I, I think it would actually be weird not to do that. So is it rational to think that the moral fruits of a religion are any indication of whether it's true? Yeah, I think that it's some indication. It's not the only consideration to factor in, but it is certainly a consideration to factor in. I think it's a really good point. Um, and to kind of echo some of your sentiments there. So my own personal deconversion story um, happened in my early 20s um, in a very religious conservative faith. And I started doubting my faith. And one of the, the uh, threads that really pulled on that is the fact that I have a gay brother. And so having a gay brother in a very conservative religious tradition, there was a very big tension there. And so I was kind of um, trying to figure that tension out. And so I've, you know, um, as time went on, I obviously sided with my brother on this. And so now kind of in hindsight, I can see um, in a way in which the meagle moral fruit reasoning probably in a psychological way motivated parts of my deconversion because I saw this as, you know, well, if theism were true, you know, my brother wouldn't have to go through something like this because he's having to go through something like this. That's some reason to think that religious tradition is just wrong. And so that's very crude. Um, did you want to address? Yeah, I mean, I, they mentioned it a lot earlier, but did you want to address the LGBTQ? Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, I want to yeah. get okay. to that later because yeah. I brought up something in my video, which made me question if they watched the whole reply I made to the Meager Moral Fruits argument. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, but we'll get to that later. But yeah. with regards to this study, I mean, this is what I was talking about in the beginning with like, you could just make one in reverse. Cause I could tell you numerous anecdotal cases where someone said, you know, I was addicted to drugs. I was doing all these horrible things. And then I found the Bible and my life was radically changed. And, you know, like, again, you could just make this argument in reverse. And uh, Ben's argument here seems to be more about a problem of evil argument. Like why would his brother have to go through with this? Like that's more of an, 
an argument for the problem of evil. That's what I thought. This is not a meager moral fruits argument. It's just his brother was going through something. Why does his brother have to go through with this? And that would be another conversation altogether. I don't know if that's a meager moral fruits argument itself. Uh, it seems to, you know, be more of a problem of evil. So right. again, I don't, I don't really see this as strong evidence for the meager moral fruits argument. He admits this is crude reasoning. So let's be fair. But uh, or he's, you know, this is just a rough estimate of what he kind of went through. Which fine. I'm not. I don't want to dig too much into something that I don't have a lot of information on. But again, I don't really see this as strong case because if what we're using is anecdotal cases, you know, I could find all sorts of other anecdotal cases. Right. All right, let's go to the next timestamp. To get the argument off the ground, a theological premise, an empirical premise, and a moral premise. So the theological premise is essentially just that um, the predictions of naturalism and theism are not identical. Like they don't lead us to form the exact same expectations with regards to moral fruits. You know, if Christianity is true, that leads, you know, that leads us to make certain predictions and it leads us to form certain expectations about moral fruits given Christian theology and claims in Christian scripture. Um, you know, this is not something that I'm making up. I'm listening to what Christians are telling me. And um, this is an extremely well-supported premise of the argument. It's just the idea that uh, Christians should be noticeably different from non-Christians according to like Christian theology and Christian scripture and so forth. All right. Um, didn't you grant that premise in your video just for the I sake of argument? I granted it, but I with a lot of side constraints. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm fine saying that the Holy Spirit will sanctify us, but I mean, how quickly? Are we? I mean, like yeah. this is where the whole concept of purgatory comes from, which I have acknowledged. I accept and believe that there's some sort of purgatory state after we exist. We don't just magically become perfect upon death, just like we don't magically become perfect when we become a Christian. And the and here's the thing: if you notice, and I've listened to this twice now, they never give any Bible verses to back up this claim. This is a big problem, I think, for the Mega Moral Fruits argument is they have not made a good exegetical exegetical case that the Bible actually does teach what they're claiming. Uh, and if, I think if you go through the Bible, we can find pretty clear evidence that being a Christian doesn't mean you're going to be noticeably better than non-Christians. You're not going to stop sinning. You're going to have all sorts of problems. I mean, just go through the, the New Testament. Look at Judas, who spent three years traveling around with Jesus and then betrays him. Or Peter, who abandons him. You could say, well, they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. But after the Pentecost, Peter still is has racist tendencies. He, you know, Paul has to confront him in the book of Galatians about his racist issues. Uh, things just are not perfect once you become a Christian. Paul has to write letter after letter to the Galatians and the Corinthians about problems they're having, about, hey, you got this guy that's in the church who's sleeping with his, you know, stepmother or God forbid his mother. You know, oh, and you're also, you know, taking care of the poor. You keep, you treat, you turn the Eucharist into this monstrosity of a pagan feast and the poor are not getting, you know, getting fed and taken care of. Like, <laughs> it just seems like the church is always willing to say, look, we're not perfect. Paul says in Romans, I believe seven or eight, you know, I do the evil. I do the bad, even though I don't want to. Uh, first John, he says, you know, if we lie, we can't lie to ourselves and say we're not sinning. We're obviously still sinners. So like if you're going to take the Bible in its full context, I think it's very clear that the apostles constantly admit Christians are still sinning. They're still messing up. They're not somehow this moral city on a hill even though jesus called us to be that we still haven't made our made it there we still are not reaching the ideal state that jesus does not you know would like us to be at because of our free will and because we still sin so i think they need to actually make a strong exegetical case the bible actually does teach what they're trying to say in the meager moral fruits argument because i don't see a lot of evidence in biblical theology that christians are supposed to be noticeably better than all non-christians i'm i'm I, I see plenty of examples in the Bible of sinners, of Christians acting like sinners or hypocrites or doing things that are wrong. So, I, I mean, they don't. So I, I don't. I don't understand how you can make this case against Christianity without actually going to the sources, the Bible itself, and starting there. Right. So, we're, I guess what you're saying is Christianity doesn't predict that as soon as you become a Christian or whatever, you're automatically going to just become like this moral angel, right? But no, rather, no, no. what it says is like the Holy Spirit enters you and there's no there's no time constraint on how long. So like that means you could have a situation where you have Christians that are not morally indistinguishable from non-Christians. Right. Just given the fact that Christianity doesn't make any predictions about oh, it doesn't make a prediction that 
you're going to be morally perfect as soon as you, you know, become a Christian or whatever, right? The only thing I can gather in the scriptures is that Christianity says uh, the Holy Spirit will sanctify us. It never says how long that's going to take. It never says it's going to happen instantly. They need to make an exegetical case from the Bible that Christianity actually says that when you become a believer, you should be noticeably more moral than non-believers. And I don't see that anywhere in the in the scriptures. And I would like to see them make the kind well, of case without cherry picking, of course, yeah. because you could find out a verse or a half a verse here, but take it in context with all the verses that talk about Christians sinning and messing up and clearly missing the mark. Well, another thing I want to mention before we continue is um, this idea of justification, sanctification. So um, because at least as I'm a, as a, as a Catholic, I would say that um, we have to cooperate with God's grace, right? So it's not like you just, you know, oh, the Holy Spirit's in me, so no, I can't, like, I don't have free will, and I have to be morally perfect. Like, no, it's, like, you have to cooperate it with it, right? And sometimes Christians will not cooperate with grace. So it's not even just that. So not only is it that Christianity doesn't um, predict that you won't be morally perfect as soon as you become a Christian, but it's it doesn't even take away your free will so you can work you can actually work against so there's certain situations in which christians can actually become worse just because of their like you know them not cooperating with god's grace well i mean right? look at the pharisees so, they had all the knowledge of the scriptures and of god and it made them more it made them worse because they were so filled with pride and self-worth think of israel's history we have a long history of israel that was closest to god constantly failing and giving into idolatry and all sorts of sins uh, I mean, like, that's what the kings is about. All the, you know, the northern kingdom of Israel is constantly, their kings are constantly doing all these horrible things. So, you know, there's already a precedent set in the Bible that believers are not going to somehow automatically be more noticeably moral than non-believers. Just start with start with right. Adam and Eve and just read of all this, the people past that. You see them do all sorts of horrible things. And that's to really emphasize, I think, the, the point that the only perfect human was Jesus. And we've all fallen sin, all fallen short of the glory of God and have sinned. Right. All right. Well, so because this is an argument against theism, we have to some extent use claims that theists make. If theists aren't committed to the claims, then these arguments just aren't really going to be relevant. And well, that's kind of the <laughs> Exactly. No, that's just the go to the Bible. They got to go to the Bible and show that this is what Christianity teaches. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. So really the way I see it is that you're saying, look, um, theism, generalism in particular, um, makes the claim that God is a source of moral motivation, guidance and transfer in the sense that there is something about a knowledge of God that will make you morally better than if you didn't believe. There's something morally transformative about a knowledge of God. And so by taking that claim that theists make, that makes predictions, predictions that naturalism is not similarly going to make. And it's I a mean, way in which right there. we can. Like, yeah. Knowledge of God does not make you more moral. I Maybe he didn't word that right. Maybe that's not what he meant. But just from what he's saying, knowledge of God does not make you more moral. Even the demons believe and they tremble. Yeah. Right. So. All right, let's continue. Confirm or disconfirm either hypothesis. So if, um, you know, Christians were to stand out morally from the crowd, um, if that was just a thing that we observed in the world, that would be confirming evidence for Christian theism. And the fact that we don't see that is some reason to doubt it. Is that more or less kind of the – I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But. Well, I, I would just add that it's not just knowledge of God. Like there are sort of specific theological claims about like the morally transformative nature of the Holy Spirit or sanctifying grace, you know, in the context of Catholicism. Yeah. Some people will say like, oh, this is this is an argument against Christianity. This isn't an argument against theism. And my knee jerk response is just like, so what? So like, it's OK to have arguments that are just against Christianity. Like if you make an argument against the resurrection, isn't that kind of tailored towards Christianity? I mean, would it make sense to be like, this isn't an argument against Islam. It's like, who cares? Like, it's yeah, sometimes you make arguments that are just against Christianity. But the meager moral fruits structure, though, you know, it's very versatile. You can make many different versions of the meager moral fruits argument, and you can tailor it towards different religions. You know, like, it, it's, it just doesn't seem like a, a big deal that the versions that I tend to forward are, yeah, they're related to Christianity, because that's what I care the most about. I don't know if theism... All right, so is there anything... Well, I mean, yeah, uh, Ben mentioned, you know, the Christians should be able to stand out in the crowd from the rest. And I'm like, again, this just goes back, well... How do we measure that? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we'll, that, I, 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 okay. So here's the thing: if there were to be a converging um, 
let's say, converging objection to the meager moral fruits argument, I would say one objection would be the measurement pro or the measure problem. Like, how do we measure whether Christians are worse or better off than non-Christians? And I would say the answer to that question is go to the sociological literature, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I, we're not, I wanted to bring those up later, so maybe I'll just – uh, I'll, I was gonna bring it up around the 34 minute mark. So I'll wait to get to those studies I want to bring up. But I mean, like if we're going to see a Christian and here's another thing I want to bring up before I get to that is that there's a constantly a shift going on in this conversation. It goes between Christianity supposed to make us better. We see Christians doing bad things. Okay. Those two are not supposed to be equated. We can't say all the actions of Christians are the direct result of Christianity. Just like not all the results of atheists are the direct result of atheism. Same with secular humanism or veganism, you name it, anything, communist, so, so, uh, socialist, capitalist. We cannot say everything they do is a result of this one ideology they hold to. This is called an attribution error in psychology. It's like what you'll do is you'll say, you'll see someone of another tribe or another ideology and say, well, yeah, the reason why they're doing that bad thing is because they're part of that ideological tribe. But when someone in your own tribe does something ideological wrong, you attribute it to things not associated with your ideological tribe. You, you attribute it to other tribes, but not your own. So if you're a Christian and you see an atheist doing bad things, you're like, yeah, well, figures, that's what atheists are. But if a Christian does something bad, you're going to be like, well, no, that, that can't be a result of Christianity because my ideology wouldn't cause that. And I, I'm worried that a lot of the meager moral fruits arguments result in just attribution errors. Are these just basically attribution errors? Are we just... Uh, are, are you if you see a Christian doing a bad thing, can you really say that Christianity is the cause of that? Especially when the sociological research clearly points in the opposite direction a lot of the a lot of the times. Well, not a lot of times, almost all of the times. Uh, so you're going to be careful with that. And so if we're going to try to figure out how if Christians really do stand out from the crowd, we can't go on reputations because reputations are also often skewed by critics, people that are biased. I mean. Hollywood often puts out a lot of movies that show paints Christianity in a negative light. Like the movie I mentioned, Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, they're not in any way in favor of Christianity. Uh, so we need to go on what the actual sociological research covers, and there's a lot of data there. Right. So I think that was the end of the teleological premise. Is there anything else you want to say about that? Or um... no, I think I think we can move on. I mean, a lot of it I said yeah. in my in my video, the 30 minute video I uploaded, which. They didn't have time to reply in this. They said they might do something in the future. Yeah. And, and so we'll, we'll wait to see that. But Yeah, because it feels I, like to me, we do, I mean, you'd grant that premise. You would just say that, like, we can't really I grant say. It. Yeah. I grant it, but there's so many side constraints that make it basically, it doesn't have the force they think it has. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Here's the next timestamp. The theological premise and then move on to. The second moving part. Um, really, what we're the the essentially what we're saying here is that if theism is true, if we suppose there is an omnipotent and morally perfect being, um, then we would predict the lives of theists are discernibly more moral than non-theists. So that brings us to kind of the empirical piece of the argument, which you see is the second kind of moving part of the argument, which is to say that when we go to we 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 have a hypothesis that's making a prediction, and so when we go look at the world empirically, we see something different. Yeah, and I think as long as we're within our epistemic rights to confidently make descriptive and empirical claims about the world, even though we're not perfectly rational, we are like subject to some cognitive biases. Um, we we're not infallible. Have, we're, we're not infallible. Um, you know, we only ever have incomplete data sets. We're not omniscient, and yet I think we are still within our epistemic rights to make empirical judgments about the world. Um, yeah, so I think that the example that I repeatedly come to because it's just so easy. I don't think anyone could really deny the empirical premise of the argument that I usually give just as an example, which is that, you know, uh, if Christianity were true, then it would be an aid to the good, the pursuit of the good for oneself and for others, and not an obstacle to the pursuit of the good. Christianity is clearly an obstacle to legal and social equality for gay people. Um, I don't see who could deny that empirical premise that, like, it was and still is an obstacle to that. And then it's just a moral judgment. Yeah, I'll deny it. <laughs> um, yeah, and why don't, why don't I just... In my meager moral fruits video, so I, I wonder if they watched it all the way through, because I, I did bring this up. I did bring up this whole issue. In about 25 minutes in, I'll just quote from my script. For example, Green uses the example of Christianity has historically been an obstacle to LGBT equality. However, research has demonstrated that LGBTQ 
Prejudice might not be tied to religiosity in Christians, but another factor called traditionalism or right-wing authoritarianism. One robust study conducted in Brazil found that the beliefs such as right-wing authoritarianism and adherence to traditional values fully mediated the relationship between religiosity and LGBTQ prejudice. To quote from the study directly, the factor traditionalism fully mediated the path connecting religiosity and prejudice towards sexual and gender diversity. That is, not only reduced the magnitude of the association from 0.3 to negative 0.23. End quote. Second quote, it is not religiosity itself or the degree of religious practice that motivates prejudice, but rather the degree of adherence to traditional values, end quote. Okay, that's not the only study. I actually brought up three other ones in, in that video that also found similar conclusions, but this one I think was the most robust one. Generally, what they're showing is that it's not so much religiosity. In fact, religiosity was negatively correlated with prejudice in this study. It was the factor traditionalism. It was the factor right-wing authoritarianism that was causing... Uh, religious prejudice. And I bring that up because if I, I want to remind people of a video I did, I think in May called does Christianity cause Christian nationalism. And when I argued in that video with the help of the sociologist, Kenneth Vaughn, so not just coming from me, but a lot of that research came from him or he, he sent it to me. Uh, when people start moving away from Christianity, especially on the right, right wing people, they hold on to Christian symbols and they reinterpret them in political ways. They gravitate towards right-wing authoritarianism. They gravitate towards anti-immigration policies. They gravitate towards nationalistic tendencies. This study that I was talking about just now shows that right-wing authoritarianism is more responsible for the prejudice issues. Now, you can make a pretty a good extrapolation from this that if, if right-wing authoritarianism is what happens when people on the right gravitate away from religiosity the, and they gravitate more towards racism, gravitate more towards anti-immigration policies. It seems as though the, a lot of the prejudice is not being held up by Christianity in the sociological research, but from people that are moving away towards right-wing authoritarian views and not uh, trying hard to get closer with Christian doctrines and Christian beliefs and these kinds of things. And for people who want to know, the study that I, I quoted is Mediational effects of right-wing authoritarianism factors in, in the path religiosity, prejudice towards sexual and gender diversity. And it was done very recently, I think in 2019. So I would challenge that because it does seem, and I'm not saying this, I'm trying to rely on the data here. It does seem religiosity is not the cause of LGBTQ prejudice or denial of equal rights. It seems that's coming from other factors, traditionalism, right-wing authoritarianism, and other research, as I said in my video on Christian nationalism, shows that when you start to get into right-wing authoritarianism and these associated ideas, that's it, that happens when you move away from religiosity, not gravitate more closer to it. Right. So I guess, because I think this might provide a rebutting defeat and not just an other kind of defeat to what they're saying is that has re intrinsic religiosity been correlated with positive, um, in, in, ten, in terms of, um, has it been correlated with, social equality so lgbt equality has intrinsic religiosity correlated with higher lgbt social equality or has it not correlated with that so what yeah what, we we see no evidence that, in, that intrinsic religiosity leads to prejudice the meta-analysis from 2010 on religiosity and racism slash prejudice uh actually says in the conclusion we find no evidence that the promotion of Christian of Christian religiosity leads to higher levels of prejudice or racism. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, okay. Intrinsic religiosity uh, was actually on the same level as quest orientation in terms of uh, in terms of um, uh, how it correlated with racism uh, and prejudice. It, it, meaning, it didn't correlate. The only ones that did correlate with prejudice was um, what is called as religious fundamentalism, and that's defined in a different way than what people mostly think of. Yeah, uh, it doesn't mean you hold to the fundamentals of religion. You mean outlier, crazy people that are, mm -hmm. you know, more political than anything else is more of what it, it lines with. But uh, so the only things that did correlate with prejudice was religious fundamentalism and extrinsic religiosity, which, again, extrinsic religiosity is also what happens when you move away from the core tenets of faith. It's not what happens when you're getting closer to the core tenets of faith. OK, because I was just I was just asking because I was wondering if this could be a undercutting defeater or a budding defeater to their claim here. Um yeah, I mean, it's about what the data yeah. says. Look, I would have said on, on the surface, yeah, maybe Christianity is a hindrance to this. But when you get into the data, it, it doesn't show that. So I'm trying to follow the data where it leads. Right. So 
I guess that kind of objection won't really work here because they're, and, yeah. And again, I want to emphasize, what is this argument directed at? Is it directed at Christianity or is it directed at Christians? Because I constantly see proponents equating the two. They'll talk about Christianity and Christians. But again, those two things cannot be equated. Christians can sometimes be a hindrance to the good. Uh, I think we can fully acknowledge it. That does not mean it's be coming from Christianity and therefore it's not coming from the Holy Spirit that would be sanctifying Christians. We cannot constantly keep equating all the actions of Christians with Christianity itself. If right. the argument is directed at Christianity, you cannot just say, well, I've seen Christians do bad things or I've seen Christians be a hindrance to the good. It's, the question is, is it Christianity in Christians that's a hindrance to the good? Right, because it feels like to me, um, if you're going to say, oh, it's just Christians, well, you got to realize Christians have free will. It's not like the Holy Spirit guides all their actions. They can work against the Holy Spirit, right? And they that that's sort of what I have always thought, like, if there is Christian, if, if since there are Christians out there that do fight against LGBTQ equality, right, those motivations are not going to be in based in terms of intrinsic religiosity, but rather they're going to be based on these other political factors. And so that's going to motivate them to work against the Holy Spirit in that situation. So I think that would itself provide an undercutting defeater to the argument. And again, if someone yeah. says that's not falsifiable, Go into the data. The studies can separate different motivating factors. They do this all the time. Right. We can show that, like the study I mentioned, you, it's not the motivation of religiosity. It's the motivation of right-wing authoritarianism. We, in the meta-analysis on racism, you can show it's extrinsic religiosity, not intrinsic religiosity, that motivates racism or correlates with racism. Uh, so, again, you can separate out these factors. The sociologists do this all the time. Right. All right. Let's continue that well legal and social equality for gay people is a moral good like there shouldn't be different laws for people who are gay versus people who are straight. And just a third moving part a moral sub suppositions we make about the empirical empirical just uh judgment yeah. right um which i also think the moral supposition there is on pretty firm ground i mean like it, it it's not the kind of thing that requires no defense but you know i mean find me an argument in philosophy of religion where it's like yeah the premises require no defense um so yeah if you're going to offer a meager moral fruits argument yeah, the, the premises are going to be contentious, but that's not really a unique problem for this argument. So saying that legal and social equality for gay people is immoral good, yeah, that's contentious. Some people still think there should be different laws for gay people and straight people. You know, they think that gay people shouldn't be allowed to get married. Um, some people think there shouldn't be social equality for gay people. Like it's fine. All right. Um, I, I, we've already addressed this. So. Well, I mean, we addressed it, but I mean, you could also make the factor that, you know, a lot of this, I think a lot of this comes down to different uh, psychological motivations all the way like a lot of yeah. very very conservative christians are defining marriage as specifically between a man and a woman and they believe it as a sacred institution they don't look at it as like um a union that you know the government should allow between two individuals so that can also that just seems to be a definition and sometimes this results in just definitional differences uh but once again uh you know uh, there seems to be a lot of equating between christians and christianity for the argument to be successful you need to show that christians have been a um, have been a force for evil or have been holding back the good and the motivation is Christianity in Christians that's causing them to not be a force for good. Would that include um, the biblical arguments against uh, LGBTQ or or no? Because I know that like they'll use that kind well, of they argument. brought up LGBTQ prejudice like you know they're, they're denying yeah. equal rights and I don't think the Bible at all says that we should deny people equal rights. Uh, you could disagree like for example, I don't, I think adultery is wrong. I don't think we should outlaw adultery. I think adultery yeah. should not be thrown in prison. I mean, there's a difference between the moral, moral and political status of something. So I can fully grant as a Christian, I think you would too, that anyone who's LGBTQ should have equal rights yep. uh, with everyone else, even though I maybe, maybe not, I disagree morally with some of the things they do, but there's a difference there. Yep. So again, is Christianity actually teaching and motivating this in Christians? And I don't see the evidence is, is on that side. Right, so... And hey, let's continue. You're not some decisive refutation of theism, such that if you were to accept all of the premises, then you just could no longer be a theist rationally. And that's not the argument you're putting forward, right? No, definitely not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you might be right about that. I mean, it does often feel like people are attacking an argument that I'm not making. And I think some of that well, just they got it to me of, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think some of it is just run of the mill laziness. Like they're not actually reading or listening to anything that I'm saying, and they're just kind of responding to what they think the argument is, which you know is frustrating, but not exactly um, unheard of in um, <laughs> debating religion online. But the thing, like the point that I'm trying to make about these sorts of like empirical or moral judgments, which are contentious, is that convincing others that you are right about these like evaluative or empirical judgments is just a different question from you know from the actual issue here. Like even if you don't agree with my moral judgments, you should be able to see that if you did, it wouldn't be evidentially irrelevant 
to like you might not agree with me but like you should still be able to see that like if you did agree with my particular like moral claim and empirical claim that this would count as evidence yeah so um well, I mean, again, I could just yeah. make the argument in reverse. I can make a magnificent yeah. this argument. Well, like, you don't agree with my moral foundations, and you're a hindrance to me this promoting is, what I think this is, is moral. Where, this is where I think the best, well, an, an objection to the mere moral fruits argument that I would use is the measure problem, which is how do we actually measure this in the first place? Right, right, you know, beyond our personal experiences, right? Um, and again, the solution to that is the sociological literature. That's how you solve that problem. You don't just go to your own personal experiences. Otherwise, you can just have people, you know, come up with their own personal experiences and come up with their own version of a counter meager moral fruits argument or whatever. And it's it's like, okay, like <laughs> it's not going to really do anything evidentially. Well, I mean, right? and he's talking about moral so, foundations. I mean, Christians yeah. are going to reject a lot of the moral foundations that, you know, a non Christian would take the issue of abortion. I mean, we're just not yep. going to agree on that. And Christians would say that, you know, if you're promoting, you know, abortions or partial birth abortions, that in itself is evil. And we reject that. And they would say, no, 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 this is a good, we need to promote this. And so, you know, that's, a, that's, that's, here, here's another issue. Take, take something that's a lot less controversial. Marriage, marriage outlaws about divorce, divorce laws. Okay. A Christian is very much going to define the idea that marriage is about the family. We care about the children. And we think that unless there, you know, I mean, I'm not, I think divorce should be reserved for just, you know, the worst possible situation like a woman who's being abused is definitely a case of grounds for divorce. But, you know, Mar I don't think people should be getting divorced willy nilly. I think it, it sh there should be some good grounds for it. Like the example I mentioned, but if you're more of a secular humanist, you actually think, uh, I, not all, I'm just, I'm using this as just a crazy example, but a lot of secular humanists would say that marriage is more about, uh, individual happiness, individual, uh, fulfillment. And so they're going to make marriage laws a lot more lenient. And I'm bringing up this example because it's one Tim Keller I remember bringing up in a talk gave. And so even on something like that, we're going to disagree on, on how to define marriage laws. Like we think marriages, especially with ones with children should be hard to separate. And if there's going to be separation, there should be, you know, um, there should definitely be parental rights. The father should still be contributing to their children if they want to leave, this kind of thing. But I mean, if, you, if you're if you more of a secular humanist and you think that you've taken this moral foundation, I'm not saying all do, but let's say someone did, that marriage is more about the happiness of the individuals, you're going to try to make divorce laws a lot more lenient. And so we're not even going to agree on that. And we're going to, dis and we're going to say that trying to make divorce laws lenient is actually going to hurt families more because people are going to be selfish and they're going to want to get out of marriage is much easier. And we in the secular humanists could say, yeah, but I can find cases where, you know, someone was stuck in a marriage and they couldn't get out of it because some stupid judge was prohibiting it. And, you know, it caused all these kinds of problems. So, I mean, that in itself, I mean, even in something that we would think shouldn't be too controversial, can also create divide there, even on moral foundations regarding divorce. Right. And I mean, and the, the whole point of uh, the whole point of this is just to kind of point out that. If you're going to base this all on subjective experience, well, you can just, you know, as a Christian, I could just claim, oh, well, the, the Christians that I hang out with seem to be morally better than non-Christians. And that's what that's what I would expect on Christian theism. So according to my own experiences, right, Christianity yeah. is true, yeah. right? <laughs> Again, and when, we're, when we're reversing the argument, we're not saying making an argument against naturalism. You can make an argument for Christianity. This yes. is what I did in my Meager More yeah. Fruits video. It's It was this. It's not it based on any premise that naturalism makes. Is a ba it's, it could be based on the premise that the theist makes, right? Or the it's Christian based makes. on the premise. Look, if Christianity is yeah. good, it's going to make believers better. Okay, I think atheists are constantly hindering the good by trying to make abortion really easy. Uh, Christians are always fighting to end abortion. Clearly, then, you know, Christians are better, and this is evidence the Holy Spirit has changed them. So you can make the argument in reverse quite easily. Right. So it's so, like so. There's a way that um, this was put. In a blog post, this really great blog post called Why I'm an Atheist by Naturalism Next, a mutual friend of ours. Um, but he has a uh, section called Flawed Religions. But he ends it with saying, um, I'm aware that this is a fairly contentious claim. Perhaps the uh, proponents of a particular religion will claim that their religion does in fact stand out as a moral exemplar amongst the crowd. For this reason, I doubt my argument will be convincing to such people. However, I think it is clear why this fact provides me with evidence against theism. So, you know, this is a point that I've come back to over and over again about like the um, uh, person-based nature of justification. I, I think that like even if you don't share my my judgment that legal and social equality for gay people would be a moral good, um, you should still be able to appreciate that if you did, it would probably strike you as very odd that the one true religion and you know the only real followers of a perfect being have gotten this question so persistently wrong. So yeah, um, it's a. Go ahead. Yes, so, I, I mean, say. I, 
This is something I'm still confused about, and hopefully they can clarify in future rebuttals because I expect them. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I, I, have, I have other arguments I've, I wanted to use against this that I'm waiting for what I think will be the replies, and I just haven't. I got a lot more. I, when I was making this video, <laughs> I kept thinking of more things I could say, and I'm like, no, no, you're already at 30 minutes. Um, here's Is this – I'm still confused even after listening to talk after talk on this. Uh, is this a personal argument that atheists can just have for themselves, or are they trying to make an objective case beyond their personal convictions that this is actually evidence against Christianity? Because I'm still a little confused, like, especially with what Emerson just said here. Is this just a personal, like, you know, like so some Christians say, I really didn't feel the te- the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I know Christianity is true. Fine. That's your personal uh, experience. I, I would never use that kind of argument to make an objective case to someone else to convince them Christianity is true. So if, you know, if what Emerson is kind of saying here, I get a little confused and hopefully they can clarify. If this is just some personal argument. Fine. I don't have an issue with that, but I don't think you can then take this and make an objective argument against Christianity beyond your personal experience. Right. Because then you can just use you can just do do the exact same reverse and you're left. You're basically going to be left with a symmetry. Right. Um, And in that case, then you would need a symmetry breaker and then it gets a whole debate in there. Right. So I I feel like at the end of the day, the, the argument might just run into a symmetry problem because you can just reverse it. And so. Um, so yeah, help the audience too. So you don't think that we're just pulling objections out of some imaginary vacuum. So some people have criticized this argument. Um, and so one of those, uh, some of those criticisms I'll just lay out from inspiring philosophy in a video that he made, um, kind of responding to the video you made on the medial moral fruits. And he made claims like the argument suffers from too many problems, suffers from too many assumptions. And the argument is not sufficient in offering evidence against Christianity, which really what we just summed up kind of refutes that because what the claim that you're making follows from the law of likelihood. You're saying that, look, if, if this datum is predicted by this theory and not this theory, it's just straightforward evidence for this theory. So that kind of falls flat. But then to give an example of how it's almost seems like attacking an argument that you're not making, he says, the claim that atheists and non-theists are equally moral is clouded by bias with no objective procedure for how much moral fruit for Christianity to bear. And so that just seems straightforward. You're, why would we doubt this premise because of some sort of bias or lack of an objective procedure? Um, I don't okay. remember you making any claims. Yeah. Okay, then again, I'm confused. Is this a personal argument that you just feel convicted of about with your own within your own experience? Fine. But if you're going to say that this, we can objectively use this like, you know, like the problem of evil, the problem of divine hiddenness. Well, then no, you can't because you need an objective procedure to sort of show how Christianity is actually not bore the fruit it should. You need to show an exegetical case that Christianity has made the claims the meager moral fruits argument actually states. That has not been done yet at this point. I've seen no strong exegetical case. I've only seen people bring up verses where in Christians are encouraged to be the good. They're encouraged to do good things, which, sure, that's throughout the Bible, but you've got to take that with the verses that also acknowledge the fact that Christians are constantly not doing the good. And, and so what you're saying, together. what you're saying, Michael, is that they understate the evidence. <laughs> yes. It, I, okay, again, yeah. if it's just a personal conviction that people have, like, I believe this is morally good. Christianity, I don't see as helping it in my personal experience. Therefore, I can make a meager moral fruits argument to convince myself. Fine. But that's you cannot to then take that out into the public square. It doesn't work. You need to actually show, okay, how can you actually show that this is an actual moral foundation that is good? Well, you need to make a case for that. How can you actually show Christianity has actually hindered it? Well, what does the sociological research say? Uh, so that needs those two things need to be factored in, I believe. And again, make the exeget- exegetical case. This is what Christianity also teaches. Yeah, I feel like that's the other b- big problem is <laughs> their exegetical case is just completely like completely understates what it's actually teaching so um that seemed very controversial again in that empirical premise yeah especially with the the example that i keep coming back to to the point where it's like it seems like it's the only argument that i'm making but you know what does that have to do with the claim that christianity was and still is an obstacle to legal and social equality for gay people like does he actually deny that premise is it- yes <laughs> don't you deny that premise <laughs> again yeah. i want to you can't just you, again everyone is in echo chambers because of social media I always, you know what I, you know, I, I saw a lot of posts of this past couple of weeks, people claiming Christmas was pagan. You know yeah. why? Because I kept interacting with that stuff, showing they were wrong. So guess what? Twitter and Facebook want to keep showing me that kind of stuff. If you interact with a lot of things that show people outside of your tribe are bad or evil or make mistakes, 
you know, by, you know, reacting to it or commenting on it or uh, clicking on the article to read it, you're going to see more of that. So studies have shown we've all put ourselves in echo chambers where we think our tribe is always on the side of good and everyone else's tribe is always doing evil. Okay, we need to go beyond that and we need to look at what the data actually says. Is Christianity actually hindering it? And again, there is some research that shows it's not Christianity directly. It's the factors of traditionalism, right-wing authoritarianism. You can find studies that show religiosity correlates with LGBTQ prejudice. I'm not denying that. What I am saying is when researchers then went looked in further, when they went beyond the surface level, they said, well, when we get into the data even further, we're finding that it's not religiosity itself. It's just been correlated. It's not a causal factor. It's actually these other factors like right-wing authoritarianism and traditionalism that are more likely the causal factors. Right. Did anyone in their right mind deny that? Like empirical judgment? I don't know. Um, it's one of those things that I... Um, can't put, because again, it seems like he's he's looking at some other argument that you're not making. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, okay, you're, you're bringing up specific objections, and I think that yeah. Go ahead. How do they not know I was making? I literally put that in my video. Did yeah. they watch my whole video? With all due respect, I at 25 minute mark, I covered that. Right, and it seems like he would deny that premise because they 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 give the impression that it's so obviously true that that premise is so obviously true that Christianity is what causes this. When you provide rebutting defeaters for that in your video directly. Look, and I've read meta-analyses on LGBTQ prejudice and religiosity, and the researchers are also yeah. hesitant in the meta-analysis to say that religiosity is the cause, especially with the new research now, now they're coming out showing it's probably not that. But I mean, so I mean, I remember looking at a couple meta-analyses on this, and they're they're sort of sort of going, well, you know, maybe it, you know, it isn't religiosity; it could just be a correlation. And again, it is just a correlation according to this other data I've cited. Right. So that it's kind of difficult because the, no one has really converged around one particular objection to this argument. Like there hasn't really been any kind of convergence from opponents as to what the exact problem with the argument is. Well, I mean, it is a new argument, so. <laughs> well, yeah, he, um, yeah. well, keep playing. I wanted to get to. Yeah, go what, ahead. Yeah. Um, play from my like perspective, as someone minutes. who's been like kind of casually defending this for a while, it, it just feels like everyone's just throwing everything against the wall because they're certain that it fails, but none of them agree about why it fails. Yeah. And, um, you know, William Hasker mentioned this in passing. He's like a Christian philosopher. He mentioned this in passing. He's like, you know, maybe if there are, like, if there's no convergence over what the response is supposed to be to this, to some argument, maybe that's a sign it's kind of a good argument. Because if there was yeah. just, like one really decisive objection or even two or three, shouldn't there be some like convergence where it's like, okay, here's why this argument doesn't work. And everyone says, you know, roughly the same thing, you know, or the same like little group of things, but everyone says something different. Like it, I, if I cataloged all the responses that I've heard, you know, like here's why this argument doesn't work. I would say conservatively, there have been something like 30-ish distinct responses that I've seen. Like <laughs> it's a few dozen distinct responses of people who are just utterly confident the argument fails. And then there's just like no convergence about why it fails, which is, you know, maybe Hasker is right about that. Maybe he's not that, you know, if there's no convergence, um, maybe that's a hint or a clue. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But I just think it's interesting that there's no like major problem yeah. for this argument that everyone said, everyone lands on the same thing. Here's why this you can Go stop. Ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, th th this is a very weird argument he's trying to make. I mean, it's it's really I've never heard anyone. I mean, this is what I thought when I heard it. I know he's not trying to say this, but my impressions when I heard this was like, it's a very weird, weird to say that so many people are not convinced by this argument. Therefore, it's right. Like, I know that's not what Emerson is trying to say. But that was my initial impression. Like, if you're getting a lot of criticism, that that would not be that would not say to me, I think my argument is good. <laughs> it would say to me, maybe I should try to rework it to avoid these criticisms. Uh, I, I I don't know what to say there. I don't see that. It, it, I could just turn that around and say, if this argument was so good, why are there so few defenders? Why did Paul Draper openly abandon it and say it's not a good argument now? I mean, like, that would not convince them it's wrong. But I mean, like, so why would them not being convinced by a multitude of criticism convince any opponent of the argument? Right. This argument fails. It just doesn't exist right now. Yeah. So I want to kind of wrap it up then to kind of just show. So now that we have all the moving pieces um, in play and we've seen kind of the objections that have been leveled at it, I want to one more time kind of go through. So we start with the observation, an empirical observation that seems incontroversial, that um, theists have been a hindrance rather than an aid to LGBT equality. We are also making an additional okay. moral, okay. Supp moral supposition that. Yeah. Okay, so again, we'll shift back to theists now. Again, is this an argument? Again, this is constantly happening. Is this an argument against Christianity or Christian theists? Okay, I, again, if it's an argument against Christianity, you have to show that Christians have been a hindrance for the good and the motivating factor has been Christianity itself. Okay, it cannot just be that Christians are a hindrance to something you think is a good. 
um, even if that is a good, what you think is a good, even is the good, uh, it needs to show that it's actually coming from Christianity because that's would be the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so again, you well, just cannot be against Christians. I feel like they're ignoring that you can actually work against the Holy Spirit. Like that seems to be the biggest problem, at least to me, for the argument is that they, they always bring up the Holy Spirit like, oh, we wouldn't expect this to the Holy Spirit. It's like, okay, but Christianity doesn't claim that you being sanctified by the Holy Spirit means that you're always going to cooperate with it. You need exactly. cooperation. So like they right there, it completely like, yeah. But. That, that, that Yeah, that's a huge problem. They need to show an exegetical case that this is what Christianity actually teaches. And so far, that's not been done. The, the Bible never says the Holy Spirit is going to overpower us and make us do the good regardless. Paul is very clear in Romans 7. I'm still doing evil. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, there's, again, you can find verses where they're constantly saying, please do the good, do the good. You know, Go out and be a city on a hill. Go out and love each other. But then they're also saying, but you're not doing it right. <laughs> you're constantly failing Christians. Come on. That's what Paul's letters are like. I mean, you can sum up the book of Galatians pretty much in, Dear Galatians, you suck. Love Paul. Right. Um, LGBT equality would be morally a moral good. It's something that we should aspire to. So if you accept those two moving pieces right there, then the, the rest of the argument is almost uncontroversial. Like those are the two most controversial pieces of the argument. Because then what we want to say is that the probability of that observation, given naturalism, is less than the probability given Christian theism. And so from the law of likelihood, it follows that that observation is evidence confirming naturalism and disconfirming theism. And that this tells us the direction of which the evidence should be updating our beliefs. And, and this is kind of like a uh, template. You know, this is a template for the meager moral fruits argument, which is really a category of arguments. You know, like what we've been talking about is not the meager moral fruits argument. Like it's, you know, I laid it out in this sort of three premise form because I wanted to leave it kind of generic so people could form fit it to their own moral and empirical judgments. We might be able to discover an empirical and a moral supposition, a moral, an empirical claim and a moral supposition that's even less controversial. Yeah. And this is the kind of thing where, again, because so many people throw so many things against the wall, it's hard to know what to respond to. But yeah, it's like that's a sort of moral claim or a sort of empirical judgment that we should have a certain level of confidence in and, and we shouldn't be dogmatic about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, imagine a world where Christians are all kinder. That would be evidence for Christianity, I think. Um, yeah. Like, like if it was just that, known that, you know, look, Christians are very, very kind. Like they're no, like Mormons are almost known this way. Like Mormons are known for being exceptionally kind. Like, but theists could just be kind, and that non-theists were noticeably, discernibly less kind, and that that was just a thing. <laughs> that was yeah. uh, that was the empirical reality we lived in. Or, or think okay. about like um, you okay. know, like the Westboro Baptist Church and the way that they go ahead. So before we get to the Westboro Baptist Church, let's talk about this. I mean, I know plenty of Mormons and ex-Mormons uh, that have been on. That, I know plenty of Mormons that have been unkind uh, to me yeah. in the past. I know Mormon ex-Mormons that have horror stories coming out of the Mormon Church of gaslighting, sexism. Uh, guilt trips. I mean, if, if do not, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not talking about LDS now, but FLDS, the Fundamentalist Baptist Church, was just a guy in Arizona arrested who was trying to traffic young girls as his wives, uh, like Samuel Bateman, I think was his name. So, I mean, like, I mean, you can find examples. I mean, just because Mormons have this reputation, that doesn't mean it matches reality. What does the sociological data tell us? And again, if you see my video, is Christianity harmful? I just go through countless examples that show that Christianity correlates with lower levels of aggression, uh, more self-control, uh, preventing suicide. There was a really interesting study. I'm trying to find it now in the video because it's, I, I really do think it's on charitable giving. Uh, and what they actually found was that, oh, here it is. National context, religiosity, and volunteering result from 53 countries. Here's what they said. Frequent church goes are more active in volunteer work and, and a devout national context has an additional positive effect. So not only is our church goers more active in volunteering, uh, when the nation is more devout, it has an additional positive effect. Uh, religious volunteering has a strong spillover effect, implying that religious citizens also volunteer more for secular organizations. Okay, This is a result from a study in 53 different countries. Continue on. The difference between secular and religious people is substantially smaller in devout countries than in secular countries. If secularization is an ongoing process, in rich post-industrial societies, we expect declining levels of volunteering due to composition and context effects. So the more a country secularizes, the less people volunteer. The more, um, and again, in what they found in these more secular nations, religious people are still volunteering a lot of time, but secular people are not volunteering a lot. In religious nations, both secular and religious people are volunteering a lot because the religiosity has a spillover effect according to this. And again, you may think, well, you know, 
you could show these correlations, but I can cite study after study showing direct results of Christian missionary activity resulting in so many good things. Take this study, long-term effects of access to healthcare, medical missions in colonial India. Okay, We examine long-term consequences of Protestant medical missionary enterprise that spread throughout India in the 19th century. Protestant mission medicine sought to place itself within non-European so social and, institutional and institutions. We can construct a novel fully uh, database that combines contemporary individual levels. Uh, our analysis indicated that in the long run, link is driven by religious conversion and persistence of infrastructure, but possi possibly by improvements in health, in, in individuals' health and potential changes in hygiene and health habits. Another study showed the long-term effects of Protestant activity in China led to, again, uh, better, um, better overall living for people in the borders. Protestant uh, missionaries actually did lots of good things that helped that. Another good study, Christian missionaries and education in former African uh, colonies, how competition mattered. Okay, We find that this effect is mainly driven by differences in Catholic areas. Missionaries were protected with competition from Protestant areas. So what they found is our results are consistent with the economic rationale in which different roles created differences in and competition. So competition between Catholics and Protestants actually led to more education there. They were trying to convert so many people and they wanted to educate the people. They just kept uh, increasing education levels. Another study, competitive religious entrepreneurs, Christian missionaries, and female education. They found that um, missionary activity played a key role in the development of mass female schooling. Okay. The Protestant leg legacy, missions and literacy in India, found that uh, Protestant missionaries led to higher rates of literacy. Gender and missionary influence in colonial Africa, another study by Nathan Nunn, found that, again, Catholics and uh, Protestant missionaries led to strong educational effects. Diffusing knowledge while spreading God's message, Protestantism and economic prosperity in China led to strong, it, this led to a lot of great results in China, higher education rates. Three more studies, borders that divide education, religious in Ghana and Toga since colonial times. Christianity and democracy, the Catholic wave by Daniel uh, Philpot, or Philpot, is, I believe I pronounce it. <laughs> Catholicism yeah. promoted all these great things in places like Poland, Lithuania, Spain, the Philippines, Brazil, and Argentina. The church was most likely to exercise a strong influence and cause uh, incredible great results according to this study. And finally, uh, another study I can bring up, The Pioneering Protestants by Robert Woodbury and, and Tim Shaw. Again, it resulted in the rise of religious pl pluralism, democracy, a development of civil society, the spread of mass education, the origins of public sphere, the reduction of corruption, and economic development. I have one question. Can you hear the background music or no on my yeah. end? Okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll rant here for a second. So I can, I, I mean, none of those studies I, I, I brought up in any of my my my, rec my videos this this point. But again, I can constantly find study after study after study after study showing that Christianity led to more positive results in multiple ways. It just, it happens. To quote Tom Holland, I mean, I, I, I let's, let's quote Tom Holland here. Tom Holland says, secularism owes its existence to the medieval papacy. Humanism derives ultimately from the claims made in the Bible, that humans are made in God's image, that the sun died equally for everyone, that there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. Repeatedly, like a great earthquake, Christianity has sent reverberations across the world. All right. In his book, he noted that Christianity uh, helped with female equality constantly because it started to uh, erode patriarchal norms of the ancient world, that women had a right to choose who they wanted to marry. They shouldn't be forced by their fathers to marry whoever they wanted for marriage alliances. I mean, I could, I, here's, here's, a, I'm, I'm frustrated. Go here's ahead. What. Day after day, I see people going, well, is Christianity really a force for good? And honestly, the hubris of it, like I can cite study after for every one study, someone can show that Christianity is a hindrance to good. I can probably find at least a dozen showing that Christianity has been a force for good historically and currently still is. So I'm constantly sick and tired of saying Christianity has not borne moral fruits. It clearly has. And the, the study after study after study after study after study after study shows this. What more am I supposed to do? I don't know what else to do at this point. There's so much data out there. And I just cited a bunch of studies that I didn't even get to use in my videos yet because I keep finding more data. Well, it's, yeah. Well, because... I think the objection, I think the, the, I think what the core of it is trying to get at is that we don't notice a difference between Christians and non-Christians, but it seems like what you're saying is when you actually get into the sociological literature, we actually do see a difference. We, we can show, I am fully willing to admit, uh, grant Christians sometimes do the bad things or they, they sin, they do horrible yeah. things. But when we look into the sociological data, we can see that Chris, the Chris, the factor of Christianity has motivated in people 
to do a plethora of good things, to bear a lot of moral fruit, helping with the rise of science, spread of education, the rise of democracy, advancing civil liberties, colonial reforms. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. So if you're going to argue Christianity is not bearing moral fruit, please combat this data because it's just everywhere and there's so much of it. All right. Um, let's finish off the video then. They behave. Like, does anyone really grapple with like their theological beliefs? Like, does anyone even know what they are? <laughs> like, they, no, we just see their behavior. We see them holding up the signs they do and kind of standing outside funerals. And we're just like, you know, it, it's so obvious that like, oh, this is not of God. And we're judging them purely by their fruits. Like, even if you did look into the theology or whatever, so you're going into let's it. Let's stop there. I, I just want to say, like, let's not bring the outlier fringe examples. Again, is there a study showing that the activity of Westboro Baptist Church is directly tied to the motivating factor of intrinsic Christian religiosity? Excuse me. Yeah, I don't think uh, so. Yeah. I mean, I could do you should I just judge all atheists by, you know, Robert Price or you know, Stalin? I mean, remember Robert Price and going crazy <laughs> saying protesters should yeah. be shot. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, like, you know, like I'm not I think we all acknowledge Westboro Baptist Church is quite evil. They do not represent most the overwhelming majority of mainstream Christians. I mean, and again, show me evidence that what has motivated the Westboro Baptist Church is actually the factor of Christianity, or is it right wing authoritarianism? Is it some other factor in there? With probably a very high degree of skepticism because of their moral fruits, you know, and what I'm saying is like, I'm pretty sure everyone already does this. And second of all, it's fine. It's fine that everyone does this because the fruits of a particular religious sect or religion, they actually do matter. They are not evidentially neutral. Um, so do you mind if I just summarize the, the three premises, you know? Yes, please do go summarize. ahead. I was kind yeah. of running from memory. So. <laughs> I'm going to skip to... Pause it there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, we should. Um, what he was saying there, you know, we should judge it by the tenets of what the, the religion teaches. Is that what he was saying there? I can go back. Hold on. Yeah, I just want to make sure I heard him correctly. Just go back, maybe twenty seconds. Oh yeah. I don't want to. I. I mean. Yeah. I, I will. I will say this before you play it. Uh, I just want to say. It's very hard sometimes, constantly in these types of conversations, to misunderstand what the other person is saying, and I apologize if I'm misunderstanding something. But again, as Emerson wants to have a conversation, I'm more than happy to into it with probably a very high degree of skepticism because of their moral fruits, you know? And what I'm saying is like, I'm pretty sure everyone already does this. And second of all, it's fine. It's fine that everyone does this because the fruits of a particular religious sect or religion, they actually do matter. They are not evidentially neutral. Um, so do you mind if I just summarize the, the three? So, yeah, what, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so the fruits do matter, but I mean, you don't, you don't judge the fruits of a religion from what you turn on the news and see people reporting on, because uh, you, you, you do it through science, sociology, psychology, uh, historical studies, uh, so let's use that to see what fruit Christianity is actually bore. Let's not use uh, the uh, social media echo chamber we've all put ourselves in because that's ultimately what people do in Twitter is they constantly say, look at how good my side is and how bad the other side is in my right. experience. But that's, again, let's go to an objective source. All right. Um, this will be the last thing they have to say. I think that a lot of people have factored this into their uh, judgment of like what they should do and how they should live. It already is the case that people are kind of making this judgment. All I'm trying to say is that that's okay. The fact that people are making um, moral and empirical judgments about Christianity, and then that factors into whether or not they're going to be a Christian. I'm saying, yeah, it would be weird if they didn't do that. It's okay that they're doing that. And uh, I think also it might be worth having kind of like an open call about this, like uh, just going live on YouTube and then just sort of doing something that like uh, Nathan Ormond does where he has these like yeah. open hangouts. Maybe I'll do one that's specifically about the meager moral fruits argument. I definitely like, like to be part of that. If, if you do that. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Because I think it's just more helpful just to bring people up. All right. So, again, so I think that, I think it's a great idea. Again, I don't like doing that kind of stuff. Cause again, of delays and just everyone shouting at each other, I'd be fine doing that in person. But I mean, like if we're going to do it on a computer, I don't, I'd be much more interested in having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Emerson if he wants to have that. Uh, because again, I still see a lot. I mean, here. I know Emerson on social media. I could probably, I mean, I've, I've done a devil's well, advocate debate with him, so I could probably be the I, moderator. I, mean, I talked to him guys. on Twitter when I was making my video on the Megamorph. I messaged him. I said, Hey, does, I want to make sure I'm trying to represent this as best as possible. Does this sound okay? I have questions. Can you explain this to me? Yeah. I was trying my best to try to, because I get it. We're going to talk past one another because the way that information is going to come out of my mouth may not map onto your brain the way it maps onto my brain. And that's just the fault of human language. But I mean, like I was really trying to understand the argument as best as I can. I don't think I misrepresented them. I think just the argument is really bad for a multitude of reasons. I don't think they've made a really strong exegetical case that this is what Christianity actually teaches. The idea that, you know, there's supposed to be no moral evil or less moral evil among Christians. I mean, the Bible does not 
teach that at all. And again, there's a lot of side constraints on the theological premise about the whole role of sanctification, the aspect of free will. I mean, yeah. So what I guess for the theological premise, what it basically comes down to is you grant it, but only if we define it a certain, so only if it's just saying that the Holy Spirit sanctifies people, that's it. So it leaves and open about how long that takes. It leaves open about free will, it leaves open all these other things. So if you're going to well, try to make a judgment, right, then. Yeah, I mean, it sanctifies people. But I mean, I honestly, in my view, that's that's going to take. I, I mean, since Christians live on past death, my view is that takes hundreds, if not thousands of years. We're not sanctified like the moment we become Christians. Yeah. I mean, I could think I mean, I think when I first, you know, really started confessing Christianity, I was not in a good state of mind. And I had a lot of anxiety about different issues that I thought I had to tackle. I mean, when I was young. I was just, I don't understand how this is supposed to be a very, I don't think Christianity makes this claim that Christians are supposed to be noticeably more moral. It never, there's nothing in the Bible that says when you are, when you accept the Holy spirit or when you accept Jesus into your heart, you are going to be noticeably more moral than anyone who's not a Christian. It doesn't say that at all. Paul is very clear. I'm, I'm doing evil, even though I don't want to. I'm not living as Christ would want me to live, this kind of thing. But luckily, we're saved by grace. So we don't have, you know, th that's one of the points he keeps constantly hitting on. So, I mean, I don't, the theological premise is just riddled with too many side constraints. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. All right, so the moral, okay, so let, let's kind of summarize the uh, criticisms that you have. So the first thing is you would you would grant the theological premise but you would say you would kind of constrain it so you wouldn't actually agree with at least the way that they might understand that premise no i don't if, think i don't think they have a good theological case that this is what christianity actually teaches uh based on their understanding of of christian sanctification right and then the empirical premise um that you know lgbtq is um are prejudiced against by Christians. You can show that to not be true just by the studies that you cited, which was the, at least the origin of the prejudice actually comes from right-wing authoritarianism and traditionalism rather than Christianity itself. And it also, yeah. and then also, so there's a few objections. So the first objection is the free will problem, which is, well, Christianity doesn't entail that we don't have free will, so we can actually work against the Holy Spirit. I think that's actually I think that's the biggest problem for the argument personally. But yeah, even I, without I, that, yeah. even without that, even without that objection, there's other kind of objections I would sort of reference there. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, even beyond that, think of just the empirical premise itself. They said that Christianity should be judged by the fruit it bears. How do we do that? Let's go to the studies. I say ten here, just on how Christian missionary activity. And it'd be, missionary activity is very much tied to Christianity itself because it's tied to central tenets like Great Commission, spreading the gospel. That leads to higher rates of literacy, education, health, better health care, uh, more civil liberties, more spreading of democracy, colonial reforms in all of these studies. And I cited more in my video on does Christianity cause Christian nationalism, where I cited a study by Ronald to Salem that shows that Christianity correlates with, you know, more citizen empowerment, more voice and accountability. You know, less government corruption, these kinds of things. I mean, it's th there's a lot of moral fruit you can show Christianity has bore. And that's different than what they're doing because they're trying to say Christians have done bad things, but they can't show that the motivating factor is Christianity. The studies I use show that the motivator is Christianity and it does bear all these good things. That's what they need to show. They need to show that the factor that's causing them is, you know. Right. At least, awesome. at least if you want to get past the symmetry problem that I mentioned earlier, which was basically... If you're going to say like, oh, my personal experience gives me evidence that Christians are bad. Well, I could just reverse that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And show, oh, in my personal experience, Christians are actually good. Right. So there's actually no, there has to be a kind of a symmetry breaker in order to get past that. But um, yeah, anyways, I, I would also challenge the idea that Christians are supposed the Bible claims that Christians are supposed to be um, not morally equal to their counterparts. I mean, the Bible praises Cyrus the Great a lot in the Old Testament and he was not a believer. I mean, it yeah. never claims that, you know, that they're supposed to be, it praises a lot of good people that were not necessarily like Baal, prophet Balaam, another one in the num book of numbers doesn't say that these people are somehow better. In fact, there are places, there's actually an interesting place. I believe it's in the book of Samuel where um, the Philippine, the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and they take it back. And they, the way that's written 
in its ancient Near Eastern context shows that the Philistines actually had more respect for the Ark of the Covenant than the Israelites who get it back after. So it's kind of the case that when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, they actually displayed more respect for it by putting it in the temple, separating it than what the Christ the not, sorry, the Israelites do when they get it back. So I don't think the Bible ever teaches that you're going to be, you know, that believers in God are going to be morally better. Uh, I mean, I could think of plenty of people like, you know, Admiral Yi of Korea, that is probably one of the most moral and upright people in history. Uh, he wasn't a Christian. I don't think I have to claim that I'm, you know, that all Christians are somehow morally better than him or most are. I don't think that's a claim Christianity makes. Right. Um, any closing thoughts or, because I mean, at this point, I feel like, you know, we don't want to keep going back and forth video after video responding. I think the next step is going to be sort of a dialogue between you and Emerson on this. I, I think you're right. I'd love to have a direct dialogue with Emerson on this. I think that's the next step. Uh, because again, I, I, I keep seeing so many problems with this and I, uh, you know, I don't see a lot of defenders of it. I mean, even Paul Draper's abandoned it at this point. I don't think this is a good argument and I don't see how this can just also just be, be made in reverse as not an argument against naturalism, but an argument for Christianity using the same logic. You could argue Christianity is true just by using a magnificent moral force argument. Right. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and hopefully this will spark up better dialogue in the future between you guys. So, yeah, I mean, I'm always wanting to have a conversation on this directly. I think that'd be the best thing to do. Yep. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. Have a nice day.